And so as we think about regulating our emotions and what we can do to make our emotions happier, I think we have to deal with something that is just part of human nature, which is that negative emotions kind of suck. They just don't feel very good, right? So if you're experiencing some situation that makes you angry, that kind of feels awful. Feeling kind of sad or depressed, that feels awful. When you're feeling upset, overwhelmed, burnt out, like none of these things feel really good. And our instinct when we experience something that doesn't feel very good is to push it away. It's to shove it away, pretend it's not happening, like squish it down as much as possible. And I get the instinct, right? It doesn't feel good, so you're going to try to get rid of it. But the evidence suggests that the strategy kind of just doesn't work, right? So we can really explore, like, does pushing our negative emotions away actually work? And we get some insight from this um, from wonderful teachers who've thought about human nature, such as the famous psychologist Carl Jung, who's famous for saying, although it might be apocryphal, whatever you resist not only persists, but grows in size. So the idea is like what you resist persists. It comes back, right? This was kind of thinking about human nature, but we actually have some lovely data on this idea of what we resist persists from the late Harvard psychologist Dan Wagner was really interested in what he referred to as ironic processes. Um, what are these? These are cases where when you take something, whether it's a thought or an emotion, you try to stuff it down, and ironically what you end up doing is causing that thing to resurge. So when you deliberately try to like, stuff something down, you unfortunately make it resurface. And he studied this in a very famous series of psychological studies um, that built on a thought experiment that came out in a famous book in Russian literature. Um, it was a book by Dostoevsky, where Dostoevsky's character posited this problem. What would it be like to just decide not to think of a white bear? And so all of you can kind of engage in this practice right now. Whatever you do for the next 10 seconds, don't think of a white bear. My guess is that all day, none of you thought of polar bears, white bears, that bear from Coca-Cola. But as soon as I said that, bears popped in your head, right? And this was Dostoevsky's observation. He says, you know, try to pose for yourself this task not to think of a polar bear, and you will see the cursed thing come to mind. Like, as soon as you say, don't do something, your brain's like, do it, do it, do it, do it. We hate being told what not to do. Wagner decided to study this directly. Like, is this really true? And so he wanted to see this. And so he gave his his subjects in his lab the task of verbalizing their thoughts. So if we were in this right now, I would be saying, I'm giving you the talk. I'm going to be talking about ironic processing. Whatever I'm thinking about, I have to say out loud. And he gives the subjects the instruction to not think of the white bear or to think of white bears as much as possible. So in the suppression condition, it's don't think of a white bear, just like we were saying before. In the expression, he's like, do whatever you can to think of a white bear. Everybody does both of these conditions, but they do them in a different order. And the key is that every time they have the thought, oh, white bear, they have to ring a bell. So it's kind of a funny experiment to listen to because you're hearing the thoughts out loud and it's like ding, 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 every time a bell, uh, every time the kind of bear thought comes through. And so what I'm going to show you are the data that he found and the different orders of these conditions. The first condition order is when you have to express all these thoughts of the white bear before you suppress them. We're looking at what happens when you have to think as much as possible about white bears. And what you find is like when you're asked to do it, like over time it gets harder and harder because like you're forcing yourself to do it. You're like, okay, like I'm running out of white bear thoughts, right? You're supposed to be dinging it a lot and it actually goes down. But when you do this task of suppressing first, when you've tried to squash it, and then it's like, okay, now you can express, what happens is not only is it really easy, but the thoughts keep coming and coming and coming, right? What is this showing us? The more you try to squash something down, the more it comes back, right? So this is ironic processes when it comes to thoughts. But we're on emotions, and I think even more so than thoughts, when we try to squash emotions down, they come back. My favorite analogy for my Yale students about this attempt to pretend you're not sad or pretend you're not angry or pretend you're not feeling scared, it's like when we have a beach ball and we try to stuff the beach ball under the water. So you've probably, maybe some of you have done this at a pool where you take the beach ball and you stuff it and you're like moving all around because all the beach ball wants to do is to pop back up. And eventually it's going to pop back up. And if you're like me and my family, it's probably going to hit your little brother in the face and your mom's going to be mad. And like th that's what you're doing with your emotions every time you squash them down, right? And we don't like to think that this is what we're doing. Here's another meme. You try to suppress your emotions. You don't realize that you're creating an environment that's so toxic, right? Like, but that is what you're doing. You're creating that environment in your brain every time you try to suppress your emotions. And that raises the question of like, OK, negative emotions aren't going away. We can't suppress them. How do we deal with them? And the good news is that we have our psych pro tips. Yay. And the first psych pro tip is a hard one, which is that to deal with your emotions, you don't stuff them away you non-judgmentally accept them. We go back to mindfulness and the definition we heard from John Kabat-Zinn, where we're gonna 
you know, just acknowledge and intentionally say, I'm going to non-judgmentally accept whatever is going on. Or if you like, like pop music from the 1960s, you follow the Beatles and you say, I'm going to let it be. Speaking words of wisdom, let it be. So I'm feeling really angry and upset right now. I'm just going to let it be. I'm feeling really overwhelmed by this test that's coming up. I'm just going to let it be, right? This is hard because negative emotions, you have to kind of sit there and let them be. But the evidence suggests that it works. And the evidence comes from our favorite thing ever, meta-analyses. You combine all the studies on this process of accepting your emotions. In this case, they looked at 15 different randomized controlled trials. And what you find is that this strategy of just letting your emotions be actually significantly reduces your depression and it significantly reduces your anxiety. And this feels weird, right? It, basically what these studies are saying is like, you're feeling sad and you say, you know what, I'm just gonna sit with and accept these sad feelings. Your depression goes down. You're feeling afraid and you're feeling the anxious spiral. You say, you know what, I'm just gonna like sit with this and be with what this feels like. Your anxiety actually goes down. It's, it's the opposite of what we think, but it's how the mind really works. And so that's one set of strategies. But sometimes it can be helpful to give your brain something to do while you're accepting, because accepting is hard. And this is why I like the second psych pro tip of using a, a meditation strategy that's known as RAIN. Um, this is a meditation practice that comes from the meditation teacher, Tara Brock. And it's an acronym, this, this phrase RAIN is an acronym for recognize, allow, investigate, and nurture. And so here's how it goes. Like, let's say you are like looking at your homework assignment and you're starting to feel super overwhelmed or you get a text from a friend that's kind of like pissing you off a little bit. You notice there's a negative emotion there and you think, ah, this is when I can do rain. And you sit down and you commit, I'm just gonna sit with this for a second. You start by recognizing, that's the first step, recognizing what's happening. And this is, if you were a little kid, you might've heard this phrase like use your words, or maybe if your parents have like a toddler and they're like getting emotional, like use your words, like what are you saying? This is where you use your words. What emotion are you experiencing? And go deep. It's not sadness, but it's like sadness, it's a little grief and like a little bit of pissed off, or it's overwhelm with like the sense that I'm like really kind of grieving how much work I have, right? Like be very specific, that's the first step. And then whatever you come up with in that recognized step, you commit to the second letter, the A, allow. I'm just gonna allow the feeling to be there just as it is. Um, Maybe your family has like a kind of annoying neighbor who sometimes shows up like, you know, at the yard when you're outside and like talks to you and like you're not going to kick that person out. You just like tolerate them for like the two minutes they're going to talk to you and then they go away. That's what you do with your emotion. You're like, I don't have to love this, but we're just going to hang out. But you give your brain something to do while you're hanging out. And that's the next step, which is the I, investigate. And this is where you get like a nerdy scientist. You're like, all right, overwhelm all right, like pissed off with a side of grief, what do you feel like in my body? And you just commit to pay attention. You're like, huh, I guess my chest is getting tight or my jaw's furrowing or I have a craving. I really want to check Snapchat or I really want to like just do something else. Don't act on those cravings. Just notice, huh, when I get this emotion, this is what happens. And you just sit there and let the investigation process work. And the reason this investigate step is so powerful is that the evidence suggests that emotions are kind of like a wave. They're going to go up and it's gonna feel intense, but then it's gonna go down. And if you just give your brain something to do, you'll make it through that process. Most really painful emotions, if you just kind of let them be, the evidence suggests they're gonna run their course in about 10 to 15 minutes. Like they're gonna feel bad, but then they're gonna kind of tail off. And so you investigate and pay attention to what they feel like. But then you don't stop there. You know, negative emotions don't feel good. And so you do this final step of N, nurture. With some self-compassion, what can you do to take care of yourself? In another video, we talked about self-kindness, like what can you do to be kind to yourself? What can you do to be kind to yourself now? Like maybe you need to call a friend or maybe you need to take something off your plate and take a break or watch some silly cat videos on YouTube. Whatever it is, like what's your nurture? The evidence suggests that practices like RAIN can be really powerful ways to accept our most negative emotions. And in fact, researchers have looked at whether using RAIN can decrease things like trauma in palliative care workers or first responders who are seeing really negative things all the time. And they find that these practices can really help even in those kind of extreme professions where you're dealing with negative emotions on a daily basis. So it can be a powerful strategy for you to not be pushing the beach ball of your emotions down, just kind of allow them and give yourself something to do while you do that. Mm -hmm.